Well, hello and welcome back to our Sunday School. We are continuing with our study of the I Am Statements of Christ. Today, our focus scripture is going to be John chapter 13, verses 31 through chapter 14, verse number 14. John chapter 13, verse 31 through chapter 14, verse number 14. If you want to take a few minutes and study that particular portion of scripture before we get into our lesson, this would be a good time to pause the CD or video uh, so that you can do so. If you pause the video, welcome back. Uh, if not, we're going to go ahead and get started. John chapter 13, verse 31 through 14, verse 14. Uh, if you've studied that particular portion of scripture, the focus scripture for our I am statement today is in John 14, 6. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Can we start off this Sunday school, please, in a word of prayer? Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to study your word. Lord, even though we're not gathered in person in our Sunday school class, we know, Lord, that you're continuing to teach us and instruct us and lead us in the paths that we ought to follow. Lord, we ask you now to take your word, make it alive to our hearts so we can understand it and we can get closer and closer to you. We give you honor and praise and glory for these things through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen and amen. Uncertainty about the future makes us, makes us all a little bit anxious. Uh, most of us have had those situations about what is, what is this next step in my life? What's going to happen? I'll never forget my uh, first day going to college as a youngster. Uh, I did not have my own car at the time. My mother and father took me to school and uh, dropped me off at the dorm. And I was so scared I hadn't really known much about the campus and so on. They took me to my dorm and unpacked my stuff, put it all, you know, whatever. Uh, my mom kissed me by, and then I looked out the window as they drove off. And believe it or not, I was terrified. Uh, I'm standing there watching my mom and dad drive away. Uh, I'm there at the college. I felt all alone. I was anxious about what all was going to happen to me. Uh, I left the dorm, walked around campus trying to figure out where things were, had a little map in front of me. Uh, even then, as I was registered for classes and starting and so on, I was scared. Uh, it, was, it was one of those anxious moments. That is exactly the same type of feeling that's going on in John, John chapter 13 and 14. I want to put this scripture into its textual uh, scenario here, its textual uh, meaning to us. Because so many times I've heard this scripture just ripped out without relating it to what's really going on. Uh, this, this particular I am saying is Jesus's, as John's account rather, of Jesus' last few hours with his disciples. Uh, it's the upper room experience uh, just before his arrest, before his trial, just before his crucifixion. This is, the, this is Jesus' last few moments with them. Uh, in John chapter 13, verse 1, John says, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to depart from this world and go to the Father. So Jesus knew that his death was upon him. Uh, and so he keeps telling the disciples, I'm going to leave. I'm going to depart. Uh, you, don't, you don't know or you're not able to follow me right now. But the time will come when you are able to follow me. Then we have the account of the foot washing experience. Jesus is teaching uh, his selfless example uh, of service to others, the, the, the uh, true essence of the Christian life. Uh, Jesus, knowing that his time is getting ready to come, encourages his disciples not to let their hearts be troubled because he's going to go and prepare a place for them. Uh, and then he basically says, I will come back and I will escort you there. That's chapter 14, verse number three. In all of this discussion, Jesus saying, I'm going to have to leave you. Uh, my end is near. You can't come with me right now. Thomas blurts out. And you, yeah, you can read this. He said, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Uh, Thomas, of course, the classic doubting Thomas says, where, where are you going? And we don't know how to follow you. And that's when Jesus comes back with that classic statement. 
I am the way, the truth, and the lie. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And you see that in verse number 6. Now, uh, I want to side note, I want to digress here a little bit. Uh, because this is also the passage of Scripture. This isn't directly related to our study, but it's just a side note I want to give you. This is also the passage of Scripture where we have the many rooms in heaven. Uh, he's going to go prepare a place. Uh, the authorized version, the King James Version says a mansion. Uh, this is the place where you see that. I've, I've heard a lot of jokes about the different rooms in heaven. Uh, a room for Anglicans, a room for Catholics, a room for Baptists, a room for Methodists, a room for Presbyterians. Apparently like we don't get along with each other. Uh, I don't accept any of that. But when Jesus says, I'm going to go and I'm going to prepare many rooms for you. What the King James Version says is a mansion. Uh, we have to keep that within its context as well. Uh, and the many rooms uh, in a Jewish mindset as they're, as they're listening to this. They would think of the epitome of a place with many rooms. That would be like a study place, what we traditionally call a library. Uh, so uh, why does the King James Version use the term mansion uh, versus many, a place with many rooms? It's because that's what a mansion has. It has many rooms. Uh, you know, in the, if you lived in Palestine at the time, uh, as a normal poor person, your house was basically one room. Most houses were just one big room. Uh, so to have a house with many rooms would be a mansion. Even if it's not a mansion by our standards today, they would, they would consider it a mansion. And that's why the King James Version uses the term mansion when really it's a place of many rooms. Now, that's an interesting study. But I want to focus upon what Jesus is saying with I am the way, the truth, and the lie. First of all, I want you to notice again that I am statement. The centrality of Jesus in that statement. By saying I am, Jesus is saying I am God. Remember God's name, Exodus chapter 3. God's name is I am that I am. And all seven times that Jesus uses the statement I am... He's saying, I am God. Uh, so this, by saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he's saying, look at me. I'm not another God. Uh, I am God. Uh, you're looking at the face of God. Uh, so uh, this, this member of the Trinity is making himself known once again by focusing the name I am to himself. Then he says, and this is a wonderful three-point outline. Uh, I've heard a lot of preachers preach on this. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And since that's a, you know, if you want a three-point Sunday school lesson, he's already given us the three points right in order. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. So let's look at the first part of his statement where he says, I am the way. Now he doesn't say, I'm going to show you the way to God. He says, I am the way. There's a big difference between showing the way and being the way. Um, anybody who knows me, who's ever ridden around with me in town especially, everybody knows I'm directionally challenged in vehicles. Uh, even if I've been to a place before, remembering how to get there boggles my mind. I don't follow directions on the road very well. Uh, I, I just have issues with it. I always have. Back in the days before GPS... Uh, I used to keep in my car one of those big book maps from State Farm. Uh, and there have been many times people have seen me beside the road looking at the map. Because I didn't know where I was going. And like most proud men, I didn't want to stop and ask anybody. Uh, I, had, I had to look at the map and try to figure out where it was I was trying, trying to get to. GPS was a lifesaver to me. Uh, because... As that, as, as that lifesaver, you know, I can punch in where, you know, address of where I'm going or whatever. It tells me left, right, so on and so forth. And that's a lot better than people's directions. My wife one time gave me directions to try to find a particular church I was going to in Nashville uh, that I was going to speak at. And the road ended at a left or a right and in front of me was the brick of another church, the, the side of the building. 
I kept going back and forth looking for this street that she was talking to me about. I could never find it. Didn't have GPS. I went, you know, and all I had to do was go around that church and find the street with the same name and it was easy to find. I didn't know that. That wasn't part of the directions. If I'd have had GPS, I'd have known exactly where to go. So, uh, you know, having that GPS is good. It shows me the way. It's kind of ironic. My son laughs at me because when I'm in Nashville, uh, I, I GPS everything. Uh, you know, I just, I just GPS everything. I'm not good at getting around Nashville. You put me in Chicago, on the other hand, I don't need a GPS. That's home. Uh, you know, I lived there before. I was born there. I know the roads. And, you know, and, and, and Michael will say to me, why is it you don't need a GPS in Chicago, but you need it in Nashville? It's because I know the roads of Chicago, and I don't know the roads of Nashville. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> just one of those things, I have to have that thing to show me the way in Nashville. But in Chicago, I know the way. Ladies and gentlemen, can I tell you that as I stand here today, I know the way. I know the way to heaven. I've met him for myself. And his name is Jesus Christ. He's not just a GPS. He is the way to heaven. The only way. You know, he's not one of many ways. It's not like that there's a detour method that you can use to get around the way. No. He is the way. If you want to make it to heaven, he is the only way. I've heard people try to talk about how different religions... Uh, are all meaning the same thing, all worshiping the same God. And though I could do a long study, in fact, I did a study of cults and so on earlier on, uh, although I could do a study of that, the bottom line is that's not true. Christianity is not the same as Buddhism, is not the same as Hinduism, is not the same as Islam. Uh, they are not all the same way of getting to heaven. Uh, and they, and they all do not succeed. You know, I've heard people say, well, if you're a good, a good Muslim or a good Christian, doesn't really matter. As long as you're faithfully serving the religion, you're going to make it to a good place in the afterlife. That is a lie. Jesus did not say I'm one of the ways or I'm a way. He said, I am the way the, the, the little word, the definitive article Definitive means it's, 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 the, it's the only one, the way. Uh, so if you're, you know, if you're trying to make heaven your home, it's only because you have accepted Jesus Christ, his grace in your life, and his blood has washed you clean and white as snow. Uh, and that, that, that is a salvation message for sure. Jesus said, I am the way. But he follows it up with the statement, I am the truth. Notice again, the this second part explains the first part. Why is it Jesus is not just a way? Why is it that all religions are not the same? Why is it that Christianity purports that Jesus is the only way you're going to make it to heaven? Why do we hold that so strongly? It's because of number, th uh, <laughs> number two in this statement when Jesus says, I am the truth. You see... There are a lot of people who do not believe in absolute truth. They try to make truth subjective. Now, I do agree with the fact that truths change based upon new revelation. I agree with that. There was a time on planet Earth that a lot of people in the Western culture believed that the world was flat. Uh, they told Christopher Columbus... That if you sail on the ocean, you're going to fall off. Uh, the world was flat. There's nothing else over there but water. And you will fall off the planet because it's totally flat. Uh, and of course, in light of the fact that uh, Christopher Columbus landed on what he thought was India, uh, and hence the term Indians, uh, that he landed what he thought was India, uh, it did show the fact that the earth was round. What? What the Europeans did not know at the time was that there were two big continents in the middle before you got back to India. Uh, they didn't know about the existence of those two continents. And, of course, that's where they get the whole idea Christopher Columbus discovered America. He didn't discover anything. The two continents were already here and people were already on them. Uh, it's just his idea of truth changed 
based upon new revelation. That new revelation hit when his boat hit the ground uh, because he, he landed somewhere and he didn't fall off the planet. Come to find out the earth truly is round. So truth can change in light of new revelation. But that doesn't mean that there's not such a thing as absolute truth. Using that same scenario that I gave you, we have satellites above the earth that are orbiting the earth constantly. We have pictures of the earth. When I stand here and say the earth is round, that is an absolute truth. Why do we know it's an absolute truth? We have picture proof. The earth is round. We have picture proof because we have satellites orbiting it. Anybody today who wants to claim the earth is flat, that's, that's a lie. It's wrong. We know the earth is round. It's 100% factual. There's no way to debate it. We have picture proof. Ladies and gentlemen, there are a lot of things that show us absolute truth. If I say two times two is four, that's an absolute truth. Absolute truth. There is no debate that two times two equals four. Uh, it's always going to equal four. It's an absolute fact. It's truth. If I, you know, even, even if I say something that some would, some would consider to be subjective, such as my mother loves me, I know that's an absolute truth. My mother's in heaven now, but her whole life, as, you know, as long as I was alive, as long as she was alive, evidenced the fact that she loved me, and I believe that she loves me still. If I say my eyes are brown, that's an absolute fact. It's true. There's no debate. My eyes are brown. Uh, so uh, whenever we hear people talk about absolute truth, uh, some people want to be skeptical and want to say there's no such thing as absolute truth. I think I've demonstrated the fact there's a, there is such a thing as absolute truth. I want you to listen very carefully. God's word is true. Pilate asked Jesus in John 18, 38, what is truth? The response Jesus could have easily provided is, I am truth. Jesus, as the word of God, is truth. God's word is absolutely true. In that, that also means that our sets of morals and values as based upon God's word, is at, those are absolutely true. We don't debate certain things, not as Christians. If you want to debate the divinity of Christ, if you want to debate the virgin birth, if you want to debate the resurrection, well, you can debate those things, but that also means you're not Christian. To be a Christian means that you accept the body of fact of the Bible as absolute truth. You don't debate them. You don't go to church, call, call yourself a Christian, and you don't believe in the virgin birth. You don't go to church and call yourself a Christian, and you don't believe in the resurrection. Uh, last week we studied Jesus as the resurrection and the life. If you don't believe in the resurrection, why are you going to church in the first place? If you don't believe in the resurrection, why go and waste your time? I mean, why would I go to a church, sit and listen to a sermon every week? Why would I listen to Sunday school teacher teach every week if I didn't believe that there was an afterlife and I was going to get up? Uh, it's an absolute truth that Jesus is alive and because he lives, I will live also. We believe in some absolute truths. Now, are there other situations where we don't always understand which way to go? Yes. Are there gray areas of life? Sure. However, that doesn't mean we go any, many, many, mo and just choose one. When I reach one of those places in life, and I haven't had very many, that I really don't know what the Bible teaches on that subject or which scriptures are really, really applicable. Uh, whenever I come up on one of those, I pray. You know, the Bible is not an exhaustive book. It wasn't meant to answer every single question of life. Uh, Rory and I have been discussing over the past couple months the process of creation. Uh, and we've had some wonderful discussions about the process of creation. And we hold some different points of view, I think, on the process of creation. If you talk to Rory about what he thinks happened in creation, you talk to me, you may get some differences. Why, why do those differences exist? Because the Bible doesn't explain it all. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I can't go to Rory and say, you're wrong and I'm, you know, and I'm right. And he can't come to me and say the same type of thing because the Bible doesn't completely address the issue. But I can tell you this. We both, if you talk to us, we believe in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. We believe the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God brooded upon the waters. We believe that God said, let there be light and there was light. And on that sixth day, we believe that God made man in his own image after his own likeness. All right. There's no debate between the two of us on those central issues. Why? The Bible addresses them, and when the Bible addresses them, it's absolute truth. All right? The text is true. Now, there are other parts the Bible doesn't address that we can sit and wonder about. And just like I told Rory, and we both agree, we'll find out who's right about some of those issues when we get to heaven. Um, until then, we're going to peer through that glass darkly, to borrow from the Apostle Paul. We're going to peer through the glass darkly, and we're going to try to figure it out. But what the Bible does address is absolute truth. In those areas where the Bible doesn't explicitly address something, because as I said, it's not an exhaustive book, you do your best through prayer and study to come to an answer closest to what you believe, based upon the Word of God, God would want you to do and believe. All right. Uh, so God is still in the picture. And I believe that's where the presence of the Holy Spirit comes in. He, the Bible says he will lead or guide us into all truth. So, the, so, so those, those issues are not, that are not specifically addressed. The Spirit of God will lead us into all truth. The Bible does say that. That's why I pray. And I say, Holy Spirit, enlighten me. Holy Spirit, open my eyes that I can see what the truth is. Because right now, I don't get it. Even in that issue that Roy and I have talked about, and we've been discussing and having fun with this and debating back and forth, I've prayed and said, Lord, I don't get it. Open my eyes so I can see something new, so I can see something fresh. Uh, that's the way a Christian's supposed to be. We accept God's word as absolute truth. Now, I'm going to go one step further. And I mean this very, very clearly. When someone speaks, what he or she says is truth without scriptural support, be careful. You know, uh, as we've been talking today, you'll notice I haven't discussed in this video what the issues are surrounding creation that Rory and I have been debating. I have, I'm, I'm not discussing those publicly. You know why? Because I can't back them up totally. I can't say here's what the Bible says definitively is truth. And for me to stand up behind a pulpit and say this is true when I don't have the scriptural support for it, that can do nothing but cause confusion and chaos. So what do I do? I leave that alone. I will speak what I know to be true. I will speak what the Bible absolutely definitively says Beyond that, I leave it alone. I may have some beliefs. I may have some ideas. I may have been enlightened in a few areas, but I leave those things alone. And I don't get up behind the pulpit and preach them because I don't have the Bible to back them up. I leave them alone because as a minister of Christ, I'm here representing him and his word is always true. He is the truth. He's not one possible truth. He's not one truth claim among many truth claims. He is the personification of truth. He is true. And to quote the Bible, everybody else can be a liar. He is the truth. Lastly, Jesus says, I am the life. Now, uh, notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, I will enrich your life. He says, I am the life. There are a lot of things that will enrich our lives. Uh, have you ever eaten at one of those really, really classy restaurants? You know, one of those restaurants where just the main meal is over 100 bucks or more. You know, you order an appetizer, you just do down another 100 you order, the, you, you order the dessert, it's another hundred. Half the time you don't even recognize what's on the plate because they've so, the chef has so decorated it and whatever. You go, hmm, you know, I had a duck dinner once. Luckily, I didn't have to pay for it because I don't have hundreds of dollars put down there. But I know that my meal was over $300. And it was duck and I don't even remember what the other stuff was on that plate. 
And, you know, duck is greasy. I'm not a duck fan. But I, 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 ate, I ate some duck and I ate some of the other stuff and, and my tongue was going, why couldn't you just give me, you know, some pot roast with some mashed potatoes or something? I'd have been just as happy. I didn't need to spend hundreds of dollars on this meal. Uh, but it was an enriching experience. I had to be there in a tux. Uh, or at least a dressed up outfit and so on. You had, you know, you know, you had to dress up, you had to go nicely and so on. And people consider that to be enriching to their lives. Uh, sometimes people consider it, you know, consider it enriching to get a new car. For me, it may be getting a new book or a new computer or something. People consider that stuff to be enriching to your lives. Ladies and gentlemen, haven't you found that all of those experiences just like getting a new toy wear off very quickly. It's just a couple months ago that my wife and I went out and we got a new vehicle. We got a Chevy Equinox. And I really didn't want to buy a vehicle that day, but my other vehicle was going out on me. It was time to get a vehicle that day. And so even though I was ill, we decided to go out and get a new vehicle. You know how you sit in that car for the first time, you got that new car smell? The vehicle had that 11 miles on it. It had that new car smell to it. That, you know, driving home in that thing, it was like, hey, we got a new vehicle. Look at this. This is, this is kind of neat. Well, now, in just a few months, we have 11,000 miles on the vehicle. It needs to be vacuumed out and so on. It doesn't feel new anymore. Uh, when I go home from this recording, I'm going to jump in the vehicle. It's just like jumping in any other car. You jump in, you go home. It's lost that, it's lost that new, brand new appeal. Last year, I got a brand new computer. And I set it up, you know, and got everything going on it and so on. Had that new computer feel. Now, it's just a computer. Turn it on, do what I want to do, turn it off, it's fine. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the way some people treat Jesus. They get saved at an altar of prayer or whatever, and they have all this zeal because Jesus is new in their lives. Then what do they do? They just settle in to being a Christian. Okay, I got saved. And all that zeal and enthusiasm and the newness of being in the family of God, they, you know, it's, just, it's just like having a new car. It just wears off because they are considering Jesus to be enriching to their lives. That's not what Jesus said. He said, you know, he didn't say, I come to enrich your life. I didn't come to be the new car, the new computer, that, 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 that new feeling to you. Jesus said, I am life. I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I am life. That means by saying I am life, he says, I am transforming who you are to model me. I'm, I'm, giving a, I'm giving you a transformation that your entire focus is me. When you wake up in the morning, it's like, okay, I'm here to serve Jesus. As you go through your day, I'm walking with Jesus. I'm talking with Jesus. Jesus is the central point of your life. Even when you go to work and, you know, your mind gets on other things, you keep going back to Jesus. You don't know how many times in the day I pray and I seek the Lord. Lunchtime, I'll shut my door and I will be, you know, I will have time in prayer. Every morning when I go to school, when we are going to school because right now we have COVID, every morning when I go to school, you know what the first thing is that I do? I take 15 minutes before I even open up the lesson plan book or anything. I take my first 15 minutes and I have my time with the Lord. I'm praying and I'm reading my Bible. I have found the song as well as the scripture to be true. That Jesus being my life is joy unspeakable and full of glory. You know, I have bad situations in life just like everybody else. I go through troubles. I go through trials. I go through heartaches. People pass away, people get sick, family members turn against you at times. Things happen that uh, really hurt. But you know what I have found? Because Jesus is my life, my life, because everything I do centers around him. Even in my worst circumstances, my, my hardest times, my hardest trials, there's a joy deep down inside. That doesn't go away. I know he's there. That's why David, after being an adulterer and a murderer and everything going wrong in his life, David said to the Lord, Lord, restore the joy of thy salvation. 
He wanted that joy deep down inside because God being our lives, that's the joy unspeakable. Our whole life centers around him. So in other words, he's not just there to enrich our lives. It's not about our life. It's him. It's his life. We are totally in a hundred, we are totally 100% consecrated to Him. Jesus becomes our life. Now, granted, I'm talking about the here and now. But there's also a future aspect of this by Jesus saying He's the light. He is life eternal, life that death cannot destroy. Uh, whenever we lose someone here on earth, we know that when they're saved, they're in heaven. As I said last week, my mom's in heaven. I know that 100%. There's not a doubt in my mind where my mom is. She made her confession of faith. I was the one who baptized her. I, I, I know my mom's confession of faith. And ladies and gentlemen, my mom served the Lord. Uh, and I know where my mom is. She's in heaven. And I know that the, at, 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 at the resurrection, her body, soul, and spirit are going to be reunited. We're going to be together. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So Jesus saying, I am life, that's the future part, but it's also the present part. Our lives right now are totally focused upon him. Our lives right now center around him. And in the future, it's life eternal. Jesus is life. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a wonderful I am statement. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Notice in all three cases, the word the, the way, the truth the life. I hope this Sunday school lesson has been encouraging and enriching to you. We are going to have one more I am lesson next week before we start our new study. Next week will also be the time that I announce what our new study is. I have a couple of possibilities and I'm finalizing now. Uh, I will announce next week what our new what what our new study is going to be. I also encourage you to join in for part two of our Wednesday night series. We're looking at God's image. And we're going to be looking this coming Wednesday at God's image as revealed in Christ. Last week we did God's image in creation. This week we're going to look at God's image as it is revealed in Christ. I want to have a word of prayer with you. And I hope you've enjoyed our time of Sunday school. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the study of your word. We pray now, Lord, that you will help us to get closer and closer to you. Lord, I pray that your word has spoken today, uh, has reached someone's life. I give you honor and praise for this through Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a wonderful rest of your week.